So welcome to Intentional Aging. I guess it's March 15th here, and I'm excited to have our presenter, Katie Bowman, here today. Before we get started, I just want to give a land acknowledgement. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the lands on which we live and gather are the appropriated homelands of Indigenous peoples. We want to express our deepest respect to those peoples past and present for their care of these lands throughout the generations. We do include that every month. And I wanted to just mention that um, when we do have a longer version, which I try to do every three to four months. And then um, on in between, we'll do the little bit shorter version. If you have any questions on that, feel free to reach out and we can talk about um, why the library has been including those. Let's see, so let's get started. Um, we have an exciting presentation today with local author and biomechanist, Katie Bowman. And Katie writes books on movement, which you can find all those great books in the library's collection in print, as well as um, digital versions in Libby through the Washington Anytime Library. Um, and she's here to talk about the importance of movement and some things to consider as part of intentional aging. And with that, I would like to hand things over to Katie and let us get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, first I wanted to say thank you very much to the library for inviting me to talk today and, um, and in general, just for all the things that they do for the community. It's very much appreciated. Um, and there's probably one word in my bio that most people have not heard before and that's biomechanist. So I'll just briefly say what it is that I do professionally. Um, and that is um, biomechanics, which is a field of study that is part bio, hence the bio, biology, living systems. And then the rest of it, the mechanics part is is a field of study that comes from physics, which is uh, like Newtonian physics. So it's lever systems and pressures and things like that. So, so when you put them together, what I do is I, I figure out how movement works in living systems. And it's not always humans. Any living system is influenced by the movement environment that it's in and the loads that it experiences. That's why if you look outside and see the trees um, around your home or in the streets that you drive by, the loads that trees experience dictate how they branch and how they grow. So even the shape of a tree is sensing how it needs to move to survive in an environment and then branching or adjusting accordingly. And so humans are the same, we, we work the same way, but movement is not really something that we talk about very often. Um, we're gonna talk about it and as ad nauseum this morning, um, because I really like to open people's eyes to an environment that maybe they haven't considered before. So. I'm going to start with this concept of intentional aging. I might write books, so words are really important to me. I tend to learn best through words, um, and because every word holds these concepts that I like to ponder. I don't like to use words lightly. So when I was um, asked to do this talk on an intentional aging, I had to go look up intentional because I was like, I don't even know if I really know what intentional means. So I started with that and. Um, the definition of it was done on purpose. And then so I was like, okay, well, how do you age on purpose? Because aging is from a biologist standpoint, fairly inevitable, right? It's, um, I had this great pin a long time ago that someone gave to me that says aging, it's for every body. And it was, a an artifact from the Gray Panther movement in the 60s and 70s, which what, there used to be a mandatory retirement age. Um, and I think it was 65. And when one woman was asked to leave her job because she had aged out, um, she started this Gray Panther movement, which really looked at, it looked at, I mean, it's just like any other 
social justice movement, it's this idea that it's like, why, why, why are people who are older treated differently than other people? Like, shouldn't we have some sort of similar treatments across the board? And so I just love that pin um, because it is inevitable, but on the flip side of it, and what I'm gonna talk about now is there is something in biology that we use to delineate aging because then my other question is like okay well if I know what intentional is then what does aging mean really I think on one hand it's the passing of time so in biology we would call that your chronological age how many revolutions around the sun have you accumulated but there is also in biology your biological age and that means that you can have two people with the same chronological age, they're the same years on the planet, but if you look at their cells, their cells reveal that one person might have a lower biological age, which means their cells are, they haven't used, they haven't used up all the uh, duplications of their cells, if you will. And I'm going to read something a little bit more about that to clear up any confusion about it, but um, yeah, so, okay, so now I'm at this place where, okay, I understand intentional as we're going to do the part of aging that we can do on purpose. So that's going to be the non-chronological part. You're not going to slow down or speed up the number, the amount of minutes that you spend, but you can make different lifestyle choices that end up affecting your biological age. Okay, now I know what I'm going to talk about. Um, and so then I was like, okay, well, then we've got this field of study that I'm really interested in, which is movement. And so then the question is, how does movement relate to our biological age? And so I thought that I would um, read what I have already written down. I wrote a book called Dynamic Aging. So I'm going to read a section from that because these words have been really well thought out and um, and then more importantly they've been edited by a professional so i'm gonna, i'm gonna read this short section our bodies require movement a lot of it to operate fully this is the reason exercise is almost always listed as beneficial for numerous health issues so i'm just going to break in there to say in almost every single medical issue movement is listed as something that's preventive or restorative for an issue. Um, so it's pretty ubiquitous that, that moving more is beneficial to the body. And it's not only the muscles and joints that movement protects. A lack of exercise can affect the health of your eyes, your brain, your digestion. It can negatively impact your energy levels, your lipid panel results, or simply how good you feel each day. And a lack of exercise could be causing your cells to age faster, according to one researcher of the effect of diet and movement on aging. So now this is a quote from the Mayo Clinic. Some of us believe that aging is just something that happens to all of us and it's just a predestined fate. And by the time I turn 65 or 70 or 80, I will have Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis, says Dr. Le Brasseur. And this new study that is referenced in the book clearly shows the importance of modifiable factors, so healthy diet, and even more so, just the importance of regular physical activity. So that doesn't mean we need to be marathon runners, but we need to find ways to increase our habitual activity levels to stay healthy and prevent processes that drive aging and aging related diseases. That's the end of the quote. Here's a little bit more of my section. How is it that we can age faster? As I said earlier in the chapter, we're all aging at the same rate or are we? Each of your cells has a limited number of times it can divide. This is why our bodies don't last forever. The number of times your cells can divide is determined by the rate of loss of the protective caps of each chromosome at each cell division. And those caps are called telomeres. You might've heard the word telomeres before. So um, I'm just gonna jump to a sidebar here. This is like fun when you read your own book out loud because you can jump around. 
Telomeres are best thought of as the plastic cap on your shoelaces that prevent the lace from unraveling. Can everyone imagine that? Do we even have laced shoes anymore? I feel like we've gone slip on and Velcro. But, but if you remember at the end of the shoelace, if you look at it closely, there is this additional piece that keeps it from falling apart. So telomeres um, are, are within our cells. Once the telomeres are gone, the DNA is unstable. And just like the thread of a lace without the cap, and it is too risky to allow the cell to continue to divide. Certain lifestyle factors like poor diet or inflammation or a lack of movement can accelerate your cell divisions and the rate that you're losing the telomeres on your chromosomes. What this means is that you, dear reader, or in this case, dear Zoom attender, um, you have two ages. One age is determined by your birth date, which is your chronological age, and the other is the age of your cells or your biological age. Your biological or cellular age depends on how fast you've prompted your cells to divide and how well your DNA is maintained through lifestyle related factors. So hopefully that clarifies what, what people are looking at in the cells to determine your biological age and what the difference is between chronological and biological age. So going back to the main body of the book, once a cell has stopped dividing, it becomes what is termed a senescent cell. Senescent cells are still active, but are associated with the production of inflammatory molecules and they contribute to many what we call age-related diseases. The possible number of cell divisions we experience is not a fixed amount, but it's a range that varies. Adults range between 50 and uh, 70 divisions. Although we all accumulate days at the same rate, our cells are not all dividing at the same rate. And also the amount of telomere DNA lost at each cell division is not the same, which means two people of the same chronological age could have a different biological age, each having a different number of cellular divisions remaining before their cells become senescent. So the takeaway here is movement matters to your body on the cellular level, all right? That's my argument for movement and why we need to move more. Now, the rest of what I'm gonna be talking about is, all right, I'm convinced, and you may or may not be convinced at this point, but if you are convinced or you're willing to think about it a little bit more, then the next question is, how do I get more movement? What, what does movement mean? So as a biomechanist, I'm really also interested in that word, movement. Because when I say the word movement, most people are going to hear the construct or the idea of exercise. M movement and exercise are so tethered together in our brain that we have a hard time separating the ideas. So when I say we need to be moving more a little bit all day, some people are like, how could I possibly exercise all day? I don't have time to exercise or, or whatever it is. So there, there are three different definitions here that's helpful when it comes to figuring out how to move more. The first is movement is just anytime you change the shape of your body, anytime your body parts are loaded differently, it's really broad. It's the broadest category of movement. And then within movement is another category called physical activity. And physical activity would just be using your musculoskeletal muscle for doing every, it, 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 well, I guess the definition of physical activity is anytime you're moving your body to um, get something done, whether that's exercise or chores around the house or getting to and from your car or whatnot, then there is a subcategory of physical activity called exercise. So most of us can think of exercise as something that you're doing with the intention of making your physical well-being better. It usually has a predetermined um, duration. You're like, I'm gonna do it for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. It has a predetermined mode, meaning you're like, I'm gonna go take a walk for 20 minutes or I'm going to take a yoga class or I'm gonna go swimming. You, it really is physical fitness centric. You're doing it for the purpose of making your physical body better. Um, it's usually rhythmic 
or repetitive in nature and you've predetermined when you engage in it how long you're going to do it for it's a class period it's a 20 minute dvd session that you can follow on your uh, television or a computer at home so there's a there's a lot of structure to exercise physical activity from a public health standpoint is really where we're trying to focus now to get more people moving more throughout the day. So I'm not going to talk too much about exercise because exercise um, is, is interesting. Exercise is something that uh, it's a solution that a very sedentary culture came up with is how you should get your movement throughout the day. So there's not nothing really natural about the construct of exercise. It's a newly emerging phenomenon, sort of like dietary supplements. It's like when, when your diet, when, when the collective diet of a population has become uh, less nutrient dense. So, so maybe the foods that are now available um, have less nutrients per calorie um, or even when, when the soils have become so depleted that even the same fruit 60 years later has fewer nutrients within it, um, what we come up with is like, well, we still need the nutrient because the nutrient by definition is something that our bodies physically require. Um, we come up with the idea of supplements. Great. I can't, I'm not able um, for whatever reason to get the nutrients I need from my daily eating, which is how we get nutrients with the exception of the sun. Um, when, when there's no more movement left in our daily lives, then we turn to the dietary supplement version of movement, which is exercise, right? It's parsed out, it's in a bottle. There's specific nutrients that we're getting, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin B, vitamin bike ride, vitamin take a walk or whatever. So, so that's the second piece to pull up and just to expand our idea of like what movement means is, is to point out the difference between exercise and movement and physical activity. So we do think that that requires thinking for a second about us culturally and our day-to-day -day experience. Culture's, culture's a little tough because it's hard to see the culture that you're in. Um, but if you think about even our homes, I'm looking around, I'm in my office right now and I'm looking around my office, but if you look at your home, how many chairs are in your home? How many seats are in your home? Like if you, I always say, calculate the chair to butt ratio of your home. So that would be how many bottoms are in your house and how many individual places are there for them to take rest. Um, and taking rest is great, but we definitely have a society where the bulk of the structure of the society itself promotes not moving. We don't really think about it that way. Um, we're a very fast moving culture. So we tend to think of our culture as promoting convenience, but equally you could argue that convenience is almost always 100% of the time about reducing the movement it takes to do something. Um, so that's what the buttons and, you know, I think about the window lifting and lowering mechanism of my car. When I was little, I had to use my arms to roll it back and forth to get the window up and down. Now I just push my finger up and down. And, it, and if you actually went and made a list of all the things <clears throat> that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, moving to just the finger moving version is become, become a thing. And of course, I'm talking about a smartphone or an iPad where even ordering food is a movement of the finger. Ordering groceries is a movement of the finger now. Um, where before, I mean, even if you had to walk into a grocery store, you know, two or three years ago and move around, and now you can move it with your finger, think about, you know, my grandparents or great grandparents who, for the most part across the board, everyone's grandparents had to produce that food through actually bending over and squatting down and planting and digging. So there's just been a slow atrophy of movement from the culture. So I was thinking about figuring out, I was, I was thinking about how 
everyone can figure out where to get more movement in their daily life. And I use an, uh, an, an economy model, which breaks down all of our days into S-L-O-T-H, five categories. And it's called a sloth economical model because um, the acronym is, we are, are the period of our, our day can be broken into five categories for the most part. Sleep time, which is the S, leisure time, which is L, O is our occupation or our work. And it doesn't have to be paid work, but it's really what you spend your time doing um, in that, that fits that occupation category, S-L-O-T. Transportation is T. So that's moving yourself from point A to point B. And H is home. So we've got those five domains is a better word. They are domains in which we spend all of our time. So right now, exercise, and, and, there's, and exercise is great, um, is gonna fit usually within the leisure category. So many people don't have leisure. So, I mean, certainly we all, well, I guess I won't use the word all. Many people don't have leisure. And I do think that many people feel that the greatest limitation or barrier to movement or hurdle to movement is time. Um, so I really like to work on offering solutions to moving more that are not in the leisure category. So I'll just say right off the top of the, uh, right off the top that your exercise is going to fit into leisure. So let's talk about how movement fits into non-leisure. So we'll, we'll set sleep aside for now because there's, because that's probably the most difficult place to get more movement as far as domains go. But let's talk about occupation. So how do you assess the movement potential of all of your domains? Um, well, we can start with actually transportation because that's pretty easy. So transportation, I would, I could take a poll or a survey, but I would probably find that this town is equal to other towns where most transportation is done via car or other um, motor motorized um, vehicle. But you could also opt for active transportation, right? So active transportation would be walking somewhere or riding your bike. And the difference between walking for transportation and walking for exercise or leisure is simply the amount, the ability that you have when you expand your way of thinking um, to get more walking in, right? Because if you wanted to go run something to the store that's a mile away or take something uh, to a friend's house, or maybe you're at the grocery store and you have library books to return. This idea that maybe you wouldn't use your car, but would hop into, um, not hop into, just walk a portion of your daily errands. What that does is it makes some of your transportation period more active. So that's one example of how you can be looking at the domains of the day to get more movement. So that's the difference between exercise and movement. And it's helpful because you'll end up getting much more physical activity when you can think about movement as a broader construct than just exercise. The second piece is, is that, yes, there is moving our whole body from point A to point B. There is also how well each of your parts is able to move. So moving more, and this really uh, ties into what I was talking about with cellular senescence, that movement is really a part by part phenomenon. When we talk about movement, I exercise, I don't exercise. I took a walk today, I didn't take a walk today. They're whole person states. We're used to thinking about ourselves as moving or not. But as a biomechanist, I, and especially one who focuses on injury and disease, I can tell you that in addition to the idea that we need to move all, our whole person frequently throughout the day, there is another um, often neglected understanding of movement, which is all of your parts need to be moving as well. And those, that's now we have like two separate prescriptions for movement. One is, yes, I need to move more. The other one is, 
man, I got to get all my, my parts moving. So it, it's sort of, again, to call out the nutrition idea. There's moving, which we could liken to eating, which you would, which you would figure out how much you got of by calories. Like I ate today. Great. I'm glad you ate today. I moved today. Great. I'm glad you moved today. Okay. Now what did you eat today? So then we can see what are the nutrients that are contained within the foods that you ate. And then because diseases often happen, if we talk about diseases of nutrition, certain symptoms arise, certain diseases arise in the absence of particular nutrients. I'm just going to throw vitamin D out there right now because we live in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're probably used to the idea of like, I'm a good eater, um, but maybe you're still low on vitamin D for sunlight or dietary reasons. And so we can still not be well, even if our caloric demands were met. So similarly, you could be a regular exerciser and not be getting vitamin elbow extension and flexion. Um, maybe your left ankle, even though you take a walk every day, doesn't move very much. And so now you've got this part of your body that is sedentary. We think of our body, our whole person as sedentary or not, but you could also think of individual parts of your body as sedentary or not. Maybe you cycle every day, but as far as your hip bones are concerned, bicycling all the time doesn't really get the hip bones what they need in terms of weight bearing, right? So that's why you can see different bone changes in people for whom cycling is the only, let's say the food that they eat the most. It's their movement food that they consume, but they don't do other things that place weight in different parts. So our need for movement is very much like our need for uh, food in that there is a range of nutrition that we need from movement. So we need to, have you ever heard eat the rainbow before? Make sure that you're eating foods of different colors, that you have some protein and some fat and some carbohydrate. What's happening is you're making sure that you're getting all the nutrients. Even if you take the best food, and I always use kale as this example, I should, yeah, so I know, I know, I see your face up there, yeah. So kale as the best food, if you only ate kale, the AKA healthiest food, you'd be ill because kale is not a diet maker. It is one element and you could swap it out for other green elements, right? So nutrition in the same way, you can have something or dietary, sorry, movement nutrition is the same way. You can be a regular exerciser, but if you are only eating a single exercise food again and again, you're going to start suffering movement malnutrition. So that's a different phenomenon than not moving at all, right? Like, so, so it, it's not as simple as everyone should move more. Usually in general, we could all use more physical activity dispersed throughout the day, but also we need to, we need a much more robust movement diet. And so maybe you might've heard of cross training, this idea of like, oh, if I swim, at the Y, let's say, or taking a water aerobics class twice a week, um, that you would want to balance that with a different food or add to it. And the challenge runs into when we're always like, well, I have three, I only have three sessions a week in which I can exercise. So it's like, we already know we can do more than exercise. So maybe your, your favorite mode of exercise is hitting the pool um, at the Y, whether it's swimming or water aerobics or whatever, or water walking you could pick up some active transportation that's just going a couple places on foot to balance out the movement foods because your body doesn't really recognize the difference between exercise and non-exercise time. All your time is equal as far as your cells are concerned. So if you're in a chair for nine hours a day sitting, that is the movement food you're eating the most. So, so really, and I didn't lead with this because it feels sort of philosophical, but you're, you're never not moving. We're under a gravitational load all of the time. You're moving 100% of the time. It's just that if you work at the front door at Costco, checking people in, and you do that six to eight hours a day, then the movement food you eat most often is, is standing, right? Does that make sense? And then if you have an office job and you are in at, at your desk the bulk of the time, then the movement food you are eating most often is 
office chair, right? So again, if we look at that occupational field and think, okay, the food, the, the movement food that I'm eating the most here is sitting at my desk and, and leaving my desk is not an option because this is my work, then it could be, I need to eat a different movement food. So maybe I will uh, stand for a portion of work, or maybe I will um, adjust my uh, position in the chair a little bit so that um, my upper back or my lower back is not eating the same uh, way that I'm sitting in the chair. Maybe I will uh, schedule it so I take a lap around the office and instead of doing you know, a message or email to the person across the room that I just get up and walk over there, breaking up the way that you're sitting. So there's lots of ways to approach the outline of a day to be able to get more movement. But hopefully this big idea of it's not only moving more, it's moving more of your parts um, is, that's, that, those are the two big ideas I wanted to leave you with. So I wanna talk a little bit about the barriers to movement. I have my list working with um, many thousands of people over the years of what the often reported barriers to movement are. But if you have one that you'd like to put into chat, that would be great. Like if you're, and it can be anything, it'd be anything where you're like, I, I would move more, but X. Now I will tell you that X in so many cases is because this part hurts when I do. That's like probably hands down cleaners going by. Um, that's the most often cited reason with time being the other one, um, with, with finances being another one, when, when the perception is that you have to pay to go somewhere to move. So if you have a barrier, I would love for you to put it in. Those are just a few, and I can, I can keep reading them off what I have, but I would love to hear from you what how you would finish that statement. I would move more, but X. This is like um, a library Mad Libs. It's an intentional aging Mad Libs. So I see one here. Um, yes, yeah, so decreased muscle mass is my main barrier. I have a sore leg due to a minor injury. Very often they are physical in nature. I can't put any weight on my knees. Um, and then they also can run into safety reasons, uh, um, like, um, I, I don't know where I could go take a walk safely or, or I work, I don't get out until from work until five or six. Now it's dark. I feel like taking a walk, there's no place to go. So I just, um, I'm just going to keep reading these. Yes. It's too cold and wet to walk outside. This is my favorite one, I have to say. I, I would like to move more, but I forget to do this when on the computer. Yes, such a big yes. So one of the things that I recommend is modifying your environment for moving, to help you move more. And um, one of those ways is to take a post-it and just put it on the corner of your computer that just says stretch break. Or, or, or whatever that little stand up, please. And what it is, it's like you're, it's like a sci-fi. I love sci-fi. Thank you to the library for stocking all those sci-fi books. This is like, this is like a you from the past talking to your future self to remind you of the thing that you wanted to do back then. It's like that movie memento. You're like leaving yourself all these notes in the future. Um, I have notes in my doorways. Think about your arms. Like we think about our legs as not getting a lot of movement and certainly our steps of moving per day. They were already very low. I mean, as a culture, no other humans have ever moved as little as we do. Um, is to put, but our arms, you know, our arms are almost always on a device or um, um, down in front of us on the car or in our laps is to get them up and overhead. So to put a post-it in your doorway that says, reach up and touch me. And every time you walk through your house, there's just a little reminder for you to get a little stretch that doesn't require that you take a class or have any professional instruction. And again, I'm just gonna keep um, looking through some of these barriers. Um, I'm confused about exercise at, 
advice is I have persistent affibulation. Um, I would move more, but my left hip hurts intermittently or it's too dark outside. I'm tired from household chores. Um, I wish the weather was better. Um, okay, so, so we, we've seen a little bit of a range there. I think that everything that you have noted um, is on my list. I don't have anything new to add, but feel free um, to be able to add more. But yes, again, I'm in too much pain. These are, these are very common. And so that's why I write the books that I do. And, and even more specifically, it seems to be foot, knee, and hip pain, because even if you have a hurt shoulder, um, being able to take a walk, if you have that um, physical ability, or I mean that, that you don't have a disability that prevents walking, um, is a really simple way where you can break up a lot of your other domains with moving more. So um, that's a good one. Too many good shows on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you one for Netflix. One is, we talked about our environment. When you sit down to watch Netflix at night, do you have to take vitamins sit in your chair to watch Netflix? Or could you put a low stack of pillows on the ground? So, so say if you had more leisure time, you would go to a class, a yoga class in town, or again to the why and take a class that would get you down to the ground, you know, have you stretch your legs out ridiculously far from each other, whatever that is, into a V-sit and then lean forward, you know, so you can stretch the inside of your knee or your lower back. You can do that in a class for 60 minutes where it takes so much um, intention, just to harken back to intentional aging, or you can do it casually while you watch Netflix right? There's, there's nothing that says that you have to keep eating vitamin sit in a chair again and again and again, as delicious of a food at that it is. Movement doesn't have to totally disrupt your life, but it does require disrupting some habits. And again, that could just be what, what, so I said vitamin sitting in a chair, really, you could, you could even be more refined and say a vitamin, um, sit like that in a chair, which means you could maybe cross a leg over your opposite knee and do again, a stretch that you would normally have to go take an exercise class for to do. You could just slot it right in there when you're sitting at your computer. So again, this is always thinking broadly, broadly um, about where movement fits in. And then to those, to those pain, to those pain um, barriers, a lot of what I write is explaining about how you can find the nuance movement it takes to deal with very particular muscle atrophy, joint stiffness, you know, how to, how to proceed body part by body part in a very um, stepwise, gentle way. So that maybe you know, if your hip hurts and it's like, I can't go get on my bike or um, take a big walk, which is what I think of as, you know, it, I'm just being someone's mind, which is what counts as exercise. Um, so I'm going to do nothing rather than saying, okay, well, I'm going to use my leisure time to do really specific corrective exercises for this body part. And that counts. And I just see another question here that says, is stretching more important than actual movement? Actual movement is like a small dagger through my heart to say it that way. So again, movement is the broadest category. Um, all of your body parts need to be taken through their ranges of motion. So I think if I would reword this question, it would be more like, is stretching more important than vigorous movement or um, taking my heart rate up to 65 or 75%. I think that's more in, but what happens is the way we use words reflects the constructs that we hold of them in our minds. So that's why I spend so much time breaking down words because I think if we had a, a broader understanding of what the words could mean, and this is certainly coming meaning from 
from movement science and research, I think it actually empowers us to move more. So, so I think about this, um, and I'm looking at the clock because I can run out of time. And I thought that I would stop talking and pause and have some feedback, but look, I'm just still talking. It's just all coming out like a hose because um, I'm so excited and I get, I love talking to people, especially people that live near me where I can start to see the trails that we have filled with people walking this, the weather is getting nicer and to see people walking around downtown. If you see me out there, yell my name and give me a wave because I will know that coming to talk with you here today was, it was already worth it, but it'd be even more worth it to have that real connection. Um, oh, no, I lost what I was saying. Um, okay. This is about stretching being more important than actual movement. For me, I, how do I want to say this? We can think about that. We can think of it with, if you're talking about vigorous exercise, okay, I'm going to go back. Sorry. Those are a lot of words. Hopefully you're doing something else besides listening to me during that time. Um, when we think of exercise or movement that is important or movement that counts, whatever we want to, whatever we um, want to call it, it's almost always the uh, intensity, sweaty, heart rate elevated, right? These are the things that we tend to associate um, that you feel the resistance work, a certain amount of displeasure, right? Like that's usually what we think of when we talk about exercise that counts. It has to be difficult um, in, in the vigorous sense. And our hearts, like I think of our heart as a very important because cardiovascular disease is going to be the most important thing that the most of us will have to deal with as far as health. It's the most ubiquitous health concern is a cardiovascular health disease or cardiovascular health. We tend to focus on that type of exercise as the type that we need. And then because we're only thinking of exercise as something that we need to do 30 to 45 minutes a day, we we stop thinking about how the ability for our heart to move through its ranges of motions, not only the heart, but the lungs, right? What are, what's happening when you're taking a deep breath? It means that your lungs, which are normally a, at rest or at minimal exertion, a short shape, we'll just call them a short shape, when you take a deep breath or, or think of them as uninflated balloons, balloons that are just going, you know, you know, you're kind of puffing into them lightly. They're sort of, they're sort of filling up a little bit and they go back to, to um, shrinking. And, and that's just you sitting there watching Netflix, right? The, the, if you're watching Netflix, your lung balloons are just like little tiny puffs in there. If you're sitting at your desk, your lungs are just going through hardly any motion. So it'd be like, I'm going to hold my arm out. It'd be like holding my bicep really, really short all the time and only like moving my arm up an inch and then bringing it back in. Like this is my elbows experience. My arm moves an inch and it comes back in. My arm moves an inch and it comes back in. So my elbows experience is barely moving the joint itself. When you exert yourself, when you use your body parts more through exercise, the nourishment that your body needs to be able to do that, the nutrient it needs to be able to do that is oxygen. So when you move more parts, then your lungs are like, well, if you're gonna keep doing this, we are gonna to have to bring more this fuel in the terms of oxygen. So you better start sucking air, my friend. And then, so you start, you start having to take deeper breaths. So your lungs, which were like this tiny elbow bent like this most of the time at your desk, most of the time watching Netflix, now has to eh, start moving a little bit more, eh, right? And then if you do something really um, exerting yourself, it's starting to move through its full range of motion. Now you're huffing and puffing, right? So my arm is fully extending and bending and fully extending and bending. So the lungs are just like any, they're like your joints. They need to be taken through their full range of motion. But what's happened with us parsing cardiovascular exercise from stretching and strength training, like we've broken it all up in our minds, is we've lost the cohesiveness of the understanding, which is you cannot get yourself to exercise your lungs to the full range of motion if your body parts, the individual parts, can no longer work through their ranges of motion. Because it is you, take, it is you taking your body parts through the ranges of motion it, that's what moves your heart and lungs. Does that make sense? 
So, so, so again, just to, and this is weird, just, you know, talking to myself on a screen. It's like, does this make sense? Because it makes sense to me. So I'll, I'll, I'll just say it one more time. What makes your lungs and heart move when you exercise is the fact that all of your body parts are moving. It's the body parts moving. I'm going to say like your limbs moving through their ranges of motion, longer strides. It's those parts moving. It's those joints moving, those muscles contracting and releasing and contracting and relaxing. It's that movement that signals the heart and lungs to start their moving more. That's the order. Limbs and other big body parts, spine, move through bigger ranges of motion, which requires that you take in more oxygen. So the heart and lung motion is set, set in, uh, secondary. When your parts no longer move through their full ranges of motion, your heart and lungs can no longer move through their ranges of motion. Hopefully I was able to draw a, a longer line through that or a clearer line. So is stretching important? Stretching and taking care of those areas that have gotten particularly sticky or stiff in your body is what has to be the precursor for being able to move your heart and lungs on a more regular basis, more thoroughly, more often. And because pain is often what keeps us from moving at all, the heart and lungs sort of suffer, right? Because, because you know, I, so the number one body part, I shouldn't say number one, I think it's like one quarter of women, it might also be some men, but most of the research is on women, cannot move their whole body. So they couldn't, they can't get their heart and lungs moving very much because their foot hurts. One foot, one tiny spot on one foot, right? This is gonna be, so many people will probably be able to relate to this, right? It's like, it's plantar fasciitis in one foot. It's a Morton's neuroma in one foot. And what happens when th this tiny one inch that sits underneath your entire body weight can't carry your body weight, your heart and lungs don't get to move anymore. So, so just starting with a foot exercise program is part of a healthy cardiovascular program. Because in the end, what really is keeping us from moving our whole body throughout the day is it doesn't feel good when we move our body throughout the day. So rather than like throw in the towel of movement um, and thus start to play with those telomeres on our cells to, to, to like solve the problem. It's like, then just work on your feet. Like if you can't take a walk right now, that's fine just start working on your feet because it all matters. So that, that's just trying to tie the dot, the dots, or I keep trying, I'm mixing my metaphors. Like, can you tie dots? No, tie a bow, connect the dots, you get it. You understand what I mean. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to, um, I'll just keep adding more method. Like I'm trying to sow some seeds. I'm trying, <laughs> trying to embroider, I don't really know. Um, but it, it's this idea that you are, starting to see like, oh, so that's why, uh, like the movement, the recommended movement diet, if you will, by our American College of Sports Medicine or our American Medical Association, the AMA, is always gonna break movement into three necessary categories, cardiovascular, strength training, and stretching. And it's sort of like fat, protein, and carbohydrate. It, why you want all of them is because they relate to each other. Right. So again, um, depending on how much you know about nutrition, even if you eat well some nutrients, it's the absence of other nutrients that will make you ill. So, so if you feel like whole body movement isn't available to you because when you move your whole body, um, it hurts you, just start with part movement. Today, I'm going to just think about moving my arms more. You can do it while you're watching Netflix. You can do it as exercise. You can just write a little post-it note um, on your computer office that this says stretch and draw a stick figure, you know, with the arms going above the head. And, and that, that starts feeding the body parts what they need because oftentimes the precursor 
for body part pain is a lack of movement, right? So that's the paradox. It hurts because you didn't move and now it hurts when you do move. And so there needs to be this slow relationship between getting it to move just a little bit more until it feels better. And then it's the mental game. It's always the mental game. The mental game is motivating yourself through the parts of it that don't feel good until you get to the parts that pay off. And that doesn't mean um, no pain, no gain, because there's definitely, we definitely tend to approach exercise in a way like, well, if it hurts, that's how I know it's working. And that's not always the case. Sometimes the way that you're moving, the form or the alignment in which you're moving in is increasing the problem. So that's why, that's why I write books about form. And in dynamic aging, you can find like, so here's, here's, here's a good exercise and here's the form in which to do it. That's really safe and gentle for the joints, right? So that's hopefully a new approach. So I just see someone else that says, are you saying work through the pain? No, I'm not saying work through the pain. Hopefully that last clarification is adequate. It is, we have an aversion to discomfort. Pain and discomfort are two different things. It can take a while to figure out the difference between the two of them. But, we, you know, again, it's another paradox is it hurts when we move. So the solution is to not move so that it doesn't hurt. And that's not really a sustainable solution um, because, because now, one, you're not moving, and much of life experience is about moving. Certainly in our modern technological world, we are making movement less and less necessary to get the things, the experiences in life um, that used to require movement. And in one hand, you know, it's, we have so many services now that make it um, better and easier for those who are disabled to be able to participate fully in life. So I want to acknowledge that. But at the same time, those same services can decrease our movement without us even realizing it, you know, without even realizing it's like, what happened to the movement? I used to walk into the bank and okay, and this is all pre two years ago, pre pandemic, you used to, used to walk into the bank to get my banking done. And you would see three people, you had a dose of community, you had how many steps to go into your bank? You had 50 or 60 steps, you stood up, you had some time and you got to have that social connection because movement isn't the only thing that we need. As far as biological necessities, other people and community, especially with healthy, uh, we'll call it intentional aging, requires community. So um, I, I made a little list of, of, of ways to engage more physically, but I, I'm a big fan of um, stack, what I call stacking your life so that for every period of time, you're getting multiple needs met. So in this case, um, I would say that a need, you know, our, our basic human needs are the same across the board. We need to eat, we need to move, we need rest, we need community or other people, relationships, um, we need nature. So I'm not going to have too much time to talk about it, but green and blue spaces, very essential for healthy, intentional aging. Luckily, if you're watching this from um, the Olympic Peninsula, we are rich in green and blue spaces. Um, but, and at the same time, though, I think that many would engage in those spaces if they felt more physically robust. Um, you know, I would love to see a walking group that wasn't for people already walking and already comfortable with walking, but more like a how to walk, you know, that met at the trail and say, just show me how like I could be pushing off this hip better where you don't go very far, but maybe there was walking how to put into it. And then you had, um, I did a lot of um, research in um, a word that I don't like, it's called gerontology which is the study of you know, seniors. In, in Dynamic Aging, which is a book that I co-wrote with um, four women that I worked with for 10 years who were all in their 70s and 80s, we came up with a new term called goldener. Um, so anyway, in, in 
in, re, in Goldener research or gerontology, gerontology research, but specifically around movement, being able to do it with other people where it meets the goal simultaneously of community and movement, you are much more likely to adhere and make movement a part of your life. So that means uh, if you're on Facebook, put a post out as soon as we get done with this talk and says something like, I'd like to start walking. Now that it's spring, we have an extra hour of sunlight. Like, I would like to start walking for 30 minutes from Railroad Bridge Park or whatever it is. You know, I, you can modify the specific language. Who wants to meet with me? We don't want to go fast. We just want to go, you know, and put something out and see, see who responds. And it's like, um, the more parameters that you put to what you need, the more you'll find the exact person or people to walk with you. So think about creating community in that way. So other ways, I was just thinking locally, but these could be scaled to wherever you live. Um, there's amazing community gardens here. Um, and so that's another way of getting bending and lifting and twisting and nature and community and food. So very stacked um, investment of time. And so, so look for those wherever you are because they are in almost every place. Um, the food bank is always looking for volunteers and it often can be physical. And it doesn't mean that you have to show up and you know, stack 40 pound boxes. It means that you're up, carrying your body weight, just standing, um, moving things from shelf to shelf. Um, sometimes, right, right, right now, we have a very unique, never before problem for humans, which is it's more entertaining and fulfilling to be still with something playing on your device than it is to be out in the world, you know, like, like to go out and talk with people. Like we, every per, like we can bring so many things to us. And so what happens, we are another paradox. This is the third paradox that I've mentioned today is our bodies have a tremendous need for movement, but simultaneously in our DNA runs a program to avoid movement at all costs. Because never before have we been in an environment where a ton of movement wasn't required, right? So if you are always moving, for your survival and there's a bit of ease, you're programmed to take it. So as we create broader environments where ease and comfort are the main design characteristics, the natural unintended consequence perhaps is going to be that everyone loses their drive to move. So you're gonna have to fake it till you make it a little bit. Um, there's becoming a children's advocate for the court system. Again, that just gets you out and I mean, if you have legal expertise, or even if you don't, if you're a good minister, these are just great opportunities that we have in our um, local town to get involved in intergenerational housing developments or advocacy or creation, if that's your thing, right? Again, because we're trying to talk about intentional aging and the role of the role of elders in a community is great. And I mentioned the Great Panther movement before, and that was that was really about. Um, goldeners in the workforce, but there's many other things going on in the world in a community beyond workforce, right? There's, we all have other, other roles in our community beyond being productive at business and work. You know, there's roles in um, allo parenting. So that can be just providing what the children of your community require. That could be working with literacy programs, um, working with the library. Um, alloparenting means that they don't necessarily have to be even your grandchildren. It's just that you are thinking about the children that will be coming up behind you and um, participating in the, I mean, being the societal caretakers going forward. So there's lots of things to think about there. There's the Audubon Center, participating in bird counts, um, or you could stock, you could start a walking book club, you know, like if you, if books are your thing, books are my thing and getting together with three or four people to read a book and walk and talk about it. These are ways to take maybe already sedentary, um, things that you do on a daily basis and infuse them with a little bit of physical activity that doesn't have to be exercise. 
Um, I just see your note here about a grandma's cursive club in an elementary school. I think that that's very cool. There's all kinds of just amazing things going on. People are so creative and clever. Um, so I'll, I'm at the end of my presentation, but I'm here for questions if you have them. Um, you can write them in the chat. If you'd like to speak them, you can just unmute yourself and ask just um, if there's too many people, you might have to wait, but. Um, I think Deb has her hand up if you wanna go jump in there, Deb. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm interested actually in a couple of things and it's back to the telomeres. Is it possible to increase the length of telomere, the number of times that a cell can divide preserving the telomeres? is one, and then I'm curious about um, the relationship between in, uh, inflammation. So for example, if you have a bad knee or bad back and you know that due to arthritis, you have inflammation. So does that mean that you are increasing the rate of which your cells are dividing, therefore breaking down your telomeres faster? So I'm just curious about those, those kind of things. Well, so there's, there's probably a little bit of technicality there. And I don't think that telomeres are often looked at with within int, intra a person like the telomeres of your knees versus the telomeres in other places so the broader answer is i'm not sure but but you're you're not you you can't increase the telomere length at this point what you're trying to do is slow the rate at which you are requiring that your cells um, process themselves divide so if inflammation is part of what sets your rate, then you would want to work to decrease your inflammation. So like if you have things like rheumatoid arthritis, you know, there's, there are some autoimmune or even genetic contributors to that. But then there's also the lifestyle elements of it, which is what are other things that could be causing the inflammation, which could be, you know, diet or movement of a joint in a particular way or things like that. So that, that's what you would want to work on or address if you want to play with the rate of your telomere uh, processing, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Does anyone else have a question? Feel free to use the chat or raise your hand or just go ahead and unmute. While we're waiting um, in the back, I'm just going to read a list of just some suggestions. See if I can find it. Oh, actually, how about this? To make it even more interactive, how about this? Just for fun, since you're sitting there and we've just been on Zoom together, some people have been sitting down, some people have been moving around. I'm going to give you a little bit of, I'm going to give you a stretch for your hands that you can do while you're listening. So if you put your hands together, palm to palm in front of you, what are often referred to as prayer hands, right? Your thumbs are touching, while your fingertips are touching. Now, I want you to keep the pinky edge of the hand touching while you flip around to bring the thumbs together so the backs of your hands are touching. So you're trying to get your thumbs, can you see that up there? You're trying to get your thumbs to touch. So we've spent a lot of time the last couple of years on the computer for many of us. And so you can feel that's a sticky spot in the body. And this gives us information about the experience of your elbows and your shoulders. There's a relationship between the tension in your hands and the tension in your shoulders. Now, once you have this, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. Once you have this, see if you can pull, if your pinkies are touching your chest and your thumbs are touching, see if you can pull the pinkies away from the chest while the thumbs, the thumbs are now pointing perpendicular to the rest of your body. And then can you lower the wrists so they're at the same height as your elbows or are the wrists tight and they want to lift up this way. So this is a simple way to move more while you're at your desk doing other things. You know, if you're talking on the phone or you're reading something, your hands don't have to be on the computer while you're doing that. You can back away and stretch in that way. So that's a way, yeah, you just, it's like opening a book, but you just keep going. You keep opening, 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 opening until it comes all the way around and your thumbs touch. So is there a, a, an exercise that, or a movement like uh, yoga, tai chi, anything that moves everything that you could do every day? That's a great question. So I do, I do think that the intention of practices like yoga and tai chi are yes, to move multiple parts and to challenge multiple skills. I didn't talk too much about skills like 
balance and strength, you know. Um, but the challenge is, is that when you already have limitations in mobility, and let's talk about mobility here for a second, you tend to, it's like baggage that you tend to carry over with you into your exercise. And I wrote a different book about this. It's in a book called Movie Your DNA, and it explains this phenomenon of sticky spots. And the challenge is to learn how to do whatever exercise you're doing. Let's say that you found a really great yoga routine that you're like, okay, my ankles are moving, my knees, my hips, my spine, my shoulder, it's a head to toe piece. It's taking you in twists. Like it's getting a little bit of everything, but you are, our tendency for all of us again is to conserve energy. So unless you're really mindful of what, or being instructed in what every part is supposed to be doing, it's really easy to not move the parts that don't move and still execute the move. So I'll just tell you a quick example of what I mean. Our shoulders can be pretty stiff. So if ever, if you reach your arm up over your head, both arms up over your head, if your shoulders are really, so you might be able to get your hands over your head or maybe they're out in front of you a little bit, but they're reaching up there. If your shoulders are really tight though, when you put your hands over your head, your rib cage will move it'll move forward. So I can get my hands over my head maybe, but my low back arches a little bit because really my shoulder doesn't move much beyond this part. Maybe I, maybe I can only get my hand to the height of my eyes. So in order for me to move it higher, the movement of my hand overhead has to come by arching my back. So while I think I'm moving my shoulders more, I'm actually moving my spine more. Our shoulders are sticky or my shoulders in, those, in that example were sticky. And so you have to be very diligent or have a really great instructor of movement who's good at helping you not continue to move around the parts of you that don't move and over move the parts of you that are already over moving. So our lower backs, because our shoulders and our hips are so sticky, the lower back ends up becoming the most used joint in the body. Meaning maybe you're taking 10,000 steps a day, but instead of your legs swinging from your hip, the pelvis is swinging from the lower back. So every leg motion that you see go front to back is actually the low back extending and flexing and extending and flexing. So in that case, you're like, I try walking every day, but my back is killing me at the end of the walk. And I say, right. That means you need to work specifically on hip mobility. Right now, the way that you're walking is there's no, you're not walking with a good form for what you need. You're, you're overeating low back movement and you're under eating hip movement to say it a different way. So it's not always, yes, I think your question was very insightful because I think there are modes of movement that you can think of as a movement multivitamin. They have a little bit of everything, but you have to learn how to do it in a way that gets undermoved parts um, fully participating so that you're not taking a walk where your left hip isn't swinging, you know, if that makes sense. Um, okay, this is a great question. As I'm getting older, I'm also a caregiver and I'm trying to stay stronger than my person. I need to lift often. I try to keep moving, but what do I do about strength and protecting my body as I age. So um, yes, I, um, I've written some things for caregivers, some articles for caregivers on how would I set up my caregiving day to make sure it's nourishing my body through movement well. You can find that on my website, which I think you already put up there. It's just nutritious movement. Cheryl, I think put a link to it. You can Go to the website, or sorry, you can go to the blog on the website and just search the term, like search caretaking, and you'll see it. But um, to, to stay, how do, there, um, to be able to keep doing what you're doing well is to do it often and do it with good form. Those would be the two conditions. So if you're regularly lifting a person from point A to point B, and this goes for 
um, carrying or lifting anything, whether it's small children or your groceries um, or a gardening, you know, sack of soil from point A to point B that you learn form, you learn a sustainable form. There are shapes of your body in which it can carry and lift more easily. When you're young, you don't really care so much about form. You just do the activity. But then what happens is the activity can, I don't want to say, it can decrease in its periodic frequency. Like you, you might do the same activity, but there might be periods of time in between you doing it that get longer and longer. So something that you used to do no problem now becomes more challenging. You're not, you're not acclimated to it. So you want to lift and carry something gently every day to um, practice moving in a good way. And, they, and you can practice with lighter loads. Um, and then also uh, take, it's the context in which you're doing something. So if you're lifting every day, then, you're, then you are consuming vitamin lift every day. So you would want to be looking for other movements to surround your lifting so that your entire movement diet is more nutrient dense, if that makes sense. So um, stre stretching, you know, like stretching the parts that you're used most often. And, and if you are a lifter all the time, but not much of a walker, maybe add some walking or other pieces so that, um, so that those nutrients don't start to really stand out. And I'm, it's, I'm trying to make it simple. It can be a little bit technical, but again, it's the same thing where the way dietary nutrients work is all about their relationship to each other. So there's a chemistry when you start mixing things that maybe individually they're fine or in the presence of, and I'm thinking I, in one of my books, I use diets that have lots of sweet potatoes in them or avocados. So you have lots of carbohydrate and fat, but no protein. That diet can become problematic, but if you add protein, not as problematic. There's diseases that erupt when the ratio of, of nutrients isn't right. So to be able to go, um, to be able to be a continuous lifter, you might need to look at the nutritional foods that you're surrounding your lifting with so that you can do it for a longer period of time. That was a really long answer. <laughs> um, uh, Katie, there are a couple of questions in the chat too. And then um, while you look at there's, I think there were two in there. While you're doing that, I am, I wanted to encourage folks to visit your website because you have your podcast, you have a variety of different resources on your website. And so hard to cover them all in just a yeah. few minutes. So definitely worth a visit. And then I don't know whether the search query will work that I just dropped in there. But I just if you put in Katie's name, it should bring up um, the books, um, some of your DVDs we have in the collection, and there are some digital versions of your books as well. So um, there's lots of pieces there. And then I'll let you jump into those two questions that I saw. Yeah, for just the questions about like, what exercise, where can I do? The library's got everything and including some of the DVDs with just like, what exercises would I, what five exercises would I start for my feet? What five exercises would I start for my back or What's the daily movement multivitamin? They've got them all. Um, so you can go check them out there. And um, what was the other question? It was Paul. Yes, Paul we had have, a couple. We have a, oh, yeah. Okay, right. So as a large active man, the approach would be different for a woman with a different movement regi regime. We are all different, unique, and we'll, we'll all have our own unique approach. Uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's interesting to talk about what we need. So again, like nutrition is like, I mean, at the end of the day, movement operates just as nutrition does. It's not really much of an analogy. It's actually, it's how it, it's how it works. Um, if you were to write a book about, and there's plenty of books about nutrients from a physiological perspective, what humans need. 
in their body. But then, yes, the next, the extension of that is, okay, now how do I figure out which nutrients I need? Because everyone's going to need their shoulder, everyone's going to need all of their joints to move. Doesn't matter your size, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your age, right? The, there are certain things about anything, anything with a hinge is gonna need to have some time hinging or, or moving around. The extension, the, the, the art form, or I guess where it gets a little bit more subjective or to figure it out would be, how do I make movement fit into my day, into my particular physical limitations if I have them? Um, where would I start? Which body part? So, so there is some fluidity about the approach that you take, but at the end of the day, we're all sitting with very similar needs as far as what I've outlined right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, the good news is most of us have been living in a movement drought and are so undernourished with movement that you can get so much in so many areas because most places of our lives have no movement and so many of our body parts don't articulate well. And, and that has nothing to do with aging that has to do with culture. So I work with, um, I work with people of all ages um, and really we're starting to see children and teenagers with the same mobilities and you know, balance and strength that really matches what I, you know, in graduate school 15, 18 years ago would have seen in older populations because the environment is very different now. There used to be a strong foundation of movement during the juvenile period for humans, and that is gone. That has really disappeared where um, more children now are setting their adult shape in a, in a highly technological um, sedentary environment. So that's gonna be a whole separate issue that emerges later on. So yes, um, we do have, I teach a community class once a week. It's a free community class. It's in the barn behind what used to be Nash's. And in the summertime, it's at Jardin du Soleil. Anyone's welcome to come out. You can read about that online, what you would need to bring. Um, but yeah, so there's lots of different ways in the community to participate. And um, did I get everything, all the questions? I think that's everything. Yeah, Paul had asked if there was another one of your books kind of oh. around the, uh, let me find where it went. Let I think see. Move Your DNA. I think Move Your DNA yeah. and Dynamic Aging would be really great reads. I also, um, I'm a biomechanist, so I love really, um, <laughs> the feet, the feet are really important to the rest of the body. I have two books on feet. One is Simple Steps to Foot Pain, and the other one is Whole Body Barefoot. Um, Simple steps to foot pain is really talking about the impact, the shapes of footwear, the, the various elements of footwear have on gait and the rest of the body. And then whole body, uh, whole body barefoot is a little bit more technical. It's like the next level up. So those are all great. You could spend a lot of time reading all those books at the, from the library. Excellent. So um, Katie, I had one question that came to mind. Like I'm personally right now, I'm actually getting a trigger finger release taken care of on Thursday. And I've been noticing how my body in the few months that I've been having to live with it, where I'm feeling it. Um, when, if somebody wanted to like, have kind of like those their themselves assessed for what are they doing? You know, like if you're walking, you know, with your pelvis versus from your, you know, how you're th those types of things, is that something that you do, or is there certain types of providers that someone would go to? Cause I mean, I can see, how, I mean, everything works together and we see a doctor for this. We see somebody for that. It's like, are there professionals that do evaluate those types of movement pieces? And if so, how would people connect with them? You know, do you, you know, well, you, you have a very unique, <laughs> you know, I do. So, you know, I have, there's not a, so even like the, the way, huh, um, the caretakers of movement in our culture right now, we don't really have assigned preventive caretakers for movement. If you mm -hmm. have an osteopath, that might be someone that you could 
talk to. I mean, there's, it's, it definitely tends to be put into medicine. So physiotherapy and osteopath, like those are people who are going to be thinking about um, how the movement of your body relates to the physical experience that you're having. The challenge is it often is it goes through insurance. And so if you're working with your hands, the ability for a physiotherapist to talk about your shoulder is often limited by the way the system is set up. So like you can't really give physical therapy for other parts besides the part that's ailing you in most cases. Because of that reason, I tend to write books that allow people to self-assess. Um, I would say before you even get into like what everything's doing when I'm walking, in the movement multivitamin, that's like a head to toe sort of like, how, how are your arms going over your head? It's just to sort of, it's to start gently addressing any tension that you might have head to toe. It's, you know, it's very easy to do. Um, you don't have to really learn how it's connected yet. First, you're just going to start by moving it. Just start by moving it. See what that's like for you. What wants to move? What doesn't want to move? Why, why one side versus the other side? Um, so yeah, I mean, just, just to do it that way, you can certainly talk to your physiotherapist about like, would you recommend me doing any, what do you think about this? If I want to do this, you know, like that's sort of how it's set up to do it right now. Right.